<laughs> Sorry, I'm like... Hello, this is Julia Winup with Shamanic Art Studio, and today we have Lori Hartman. Tori. Lori. Tori, with a T. Oh, I'm sorry, Tori Hartman. <laughs> yeah. is talking about three roadblocks you must face on your way to your life's purpose. Mm -hmm. So tell us about it, Tori. Well, that whole topic came about, Julia. And by the way, before I even start, I just want to say to everybody, and I'm sure you already know this, that Julia is a master at this, and she's been doing this for years. So I'm going to let her guide me with the with the uh, with all the questions. But the first thing is that I think that what happened with this particular, and by the way, this is an ebook that we're talking about that's actually really thorough on. The, the myth, as I like to call it, of blocks. I really don't believe that we have blocks. I think that the thing that we get is we get buzzwords in our way. In other words, we'll use a term like, I was abandoned. And everybody knows what that means, but we may have interpreted that as something in our life that has blocked us. And just to... I sorry. felt abandoned or I felt blocked. Right. And so what, what happened, just to give you an example, I was working in a class and a, one of the, and I said that and a woman said, but I was abandoned. And I said, well, what does that mean to you? And she said, well, you know what abandoned means. <laughs> it means abandoned. I said, I know, but what does it mean to you? What happened that you use that buzzword, if you will? And by, by the way, the three blocks, the first one is buzzwords. We use buzzwords to hide behind and often create situations that get repeated. So that idea of abandoned. So I said, well, what does that mean to you? And she said, well, I would come home every day after school and my mother would have her back turned to me and she would just say your snacks on the table and she would ignore me. And I basically until I left the room and left her alone. And I said, well, tell me more about that. You know? And she said, well, I'm you know, she ignored me. I said, I know she ignored you and I want to validate that. But what exactly was your family life like? And the first thing she said is that her father worked nights and he would come home and he would slap the heck out of her mother. And I said to her, well, did you ever think that maybe your mother didn't want you to see that? Maybe she turned her back so you didn't see her bruising? Oh, and it completely shifted her reality. And she said, what, what do you mean? I said, well, maybe she was trying to protect you from seeing something that she felt would be harmful. So maybe it really wasn't that she was abandoning you, but she was protecting you. And when we take a buzzword like abandonment and we flip it, and we flip it to something like, protection, right? Yes. All of a sudden, Julia, her whole life changed. And I, I'll give you an example of that because the second block is uh, that we must face on, on the way to our life purpose is autopilot. And autopilot, in my terminology, what that really means is that a buzzword sets off an autopilot. So the minute you have a situation where, well, I was abandoned, what do you think that does to our automatic reflex in our brain? Our automatic thing is, I will never be abandoned. So we get into difficult relationships to recreate it. Our whole life is surrounded about, around protecting ourselves from abandonment. So everything in her life was around that. And when we reframed it, if you will, when we said, well, maybe it was protection, and she had the light, I didn't. It was really a moment when she went, wow, yeah that. And as an adult, I can see that when she no longer experienced her life as having been a victim of abandonment, and that's not to minimize abandonment. Okay. But when she re when she took that buzzword and she said, I was being protected all of a sudden her entire, not only did her past change because she reframed all those events so everything, it's almost like a, it's almost like a, a calculator that goes on in our brain. It goes, D -d 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 and it changed all the events to the mo moment she was sitting there 
And she recognized that the world and the forces of the universe were there to protect her. And it was an entirely different conversation. And so, you know, I, I say to people, just by listening to that, do you notice that her life was different? You okay. know, because we change. In, and so what happens is, and this goes into the conversation, a lot of the work I do, and, and I, I just have a, a book that's, probably recently come out at this taping uh, called How to Read the Cards for Yourself and Others. And it's, it basically, I don't believe that I teach people to read cards. I believe I teach you to know the difference between your intuition and your brain, and then your own internal wisdom comes forward. So to give you an idea of that, when we talk about the difference between your brain and your intuition, because so many people always, you know, you, you've probably heard it too. How do I know the difference? How do I know when it's my intuition or my brain? Well, the key is that your brain's sole purpose, and I always spell it S-O-L-E, your brain's sole purpose is to actually protect you. So when we make meaning of something, like we make meaning of this woman who made meaning of her mother abandoning her. Or there was another woman who had tremendous money problems, which I'll talk about how one shift of a buzzword changed all that for her. But the, what happens is our brain will shut down our intuition. It will shut down anything that it perceives as being a threat to us looking good, sounding good, or being hurt in any way. So in a sense, our brain's sole purpose is to protect us. Now, what do you think your intuition is doing? Your intuition is firing all the time. It's saying, hey, why don't we do this? And the brain's like, that's stupid, shh, buy it. <laughs> right, because your brain is going, your intuition is going, I have a feeling, and your brain goes, no, you're gonna look bad. It's kind of like having a overprotective parent that you set up right? You set up this thing so it'll protect you. But here's what begins to happen. And I'm going to tell you the five things in here that um, to know how your intuition is trying to speak to you. Number one, you'll start to feel confused. You'll go into huge confusion. You'll go into upset. You'll get very agitated, maybe even angry, bully other people. When your intuition is trying to tell you something and your brain is trying to shut it down, it will throw you into all kinds of confusion because the big thing that we don't want to be in is we don't want to be in confusion. We don't want to be lost. We don't want to be angry. But guess what? All of those experiences of being lost and confused are really our intuition. So when, when, our, when we go into a confusion, it's very important to sit back and go, oh, and be in inquiry around it. So what be in what? Inquiry. 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 So we be in the state of inquiry. That's why I always say to people, you're not angry, you're in anger. You're in upset because we're not defining ourselves by our emotion. We're defining ourselves by something greater. So if I go into anger, I'm in anger, which means that I chose that state. I chose to be in upset. And there are times I do get that choice. You know, I'll say, oh, yeah, I'm really in upset over that one. You know, and that I think is very, I think it's very empowering. And when we look at the idea of the buzzwords we place on our life. So just to give you another example, um, this this one woman said to me, and this was a money thing. So I promised y'all money, right? I said, Julia, I promised. <laughs> so this one client, you know, it was a class, and she said, uh, she said, well, she said, I can, I just can never make money. I just, it always eludes me. I can't do it. And I said, well, what's that about? She said, well, I'm just, I'm just not meant to make money. I said, you know what? let's get some of this new age like lingo out of here <laughs> you know? and let's just trash it for a minute and say, well, wait a second. And by the way, I'm going to give you all a real truth bomb right now, Julia. This is a big one, which is that. What'd you just say? I said, I'm going to give you a truth bomb. Okay. Okay. And the, and the idea of this truth bomb is this. <sighs> Our greatest wounding reveals our life purpose. And it also reveals our gifts and what we're here to do. 
And I think what happens is we use buzzwords as a way of hiding from our purpose. So I'm going to give you this money example. So this woman said, I just never seem to, you know, accumulate money. And I said, well, what do you do? She said, I'm a money coach. <laughs> oh, this is, this is like, this is, you can't, let me tell you something. And you know this, Julia, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, that's why the internet is filled with these conversations because people go, what? You know, so the point is that I said to her, you see the, you see the juxtaposition of that reality, right? And she said, yeah, I know. I said, well, what happened to you that wounded you? She said, well, money eludes me. That's her thing, elude, right? Her thing was elude. I said, well, what does that mean to you? She said, it always escapes me. It runs away from me. I said, well, tell me more about elude. She said, well, you know, it's, it, it gets stolen. Now that was a powerful one, right? And I said, stolen? Where did you get stolen from? She said, well, this is silly. And it's always, when, by the way, Always when you say it's silly, it's foolish, that's when our brain is going blah, blah, blah. You know, like, let me shut this one down. Uh-huh. Right? And, and she said, I said, well, whoa, 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 before you foolish and stupid it, <laughs> tell me what that means to you that it's stolen. She said, well, when I was a kid, it always, right? It always starts, when I was a kid. And she said, when I was a kid, my, gosh, this, I said, just tell me. So my brother stole my piggy bank and I had been saving up and saving up. And I'm, I was so angry about it because my parents did nothing and I'm still angry. And I know that's, and here's someone who's like, you know, she, you know, she's grown up, you know what I mean? This yeah. is like 30 years ago that she was eight years old, you know? Oh, right. But here's the thing. And I don't want to minimize that because we all carry that wounding in our brain, we create a buzzword around it to protect us. But the reality is that is that, that real seed in us that's about to become something spectacular. Now, in her case, she was a money coach, but she never accumulated it for herself. But she helped others. Now, what do you think that is? That's like circling the drain, right? So I said, I said so your brother took the, the money. And she said, well, yeah, he took it, and I don't ever know what happened to it. I never knew. And I said, well, what if? She said, he probably brought stupid stuff. I said, well, what if, what if he lost the piggy bank? What if he actually lost it, and a family picked it up who needed that money, and it put food on their table that night? Or what if he had an opportunity where he could – you know, maybe buy something in a store and that storekeeper had no money and that was going to be money for their, their meal that night. And she looked at me and she, her eyes went wide and she said, oh my goodness, I never thought about that. And I said, well, we don't really think about that. She said, but that would be amazing. I said, well, why don't we just say that that money went to help people? And all of a sudden, her entire shift, her entire reality of what happened shifted. Because she no longer felt that it was just lost. Right. So it went from lost or money equals loss to money equals opportunity. So by the time we, she said, well, really, that, be, that then becomes an opportunity. She came up with the word. I didn't. Because it's very powerful when you come up with that word. So she came up with opportunity and I went, there you go. Wow. And, right. So I just want you to know this woman seeing money as an opportunity all of a sudden shifted her whole dynamic and her whole reality. So when we look at the roadblocks that take us there, one of the things just to give you, a, you an example of my life, um, I had, I had, when I was five years old, my mother told me I had no command of the language. And she said, I've got to write all your papers for you. So from the time I was five years old, right? From the time, I'm sorry, I have a dog, puppy who's hurt. So he's coming over to get Aww. me. And, I'm like this. <laughs> so, and, and I, it's just, you know, what are you going to do? Hi, Dad. You can pick him up. He's huge. All right. Oh, a huge puppy? He's, he's a, okay, everybody, you get to see. Oh, cone head. Okay. <laughs> oh, poor baby. 
so everybody can see you because you're totally cute. Yeah. Come here. Come here. Wanna, we're just going to tilt this a little so they can see you. Hi. Oh. Hi, sweet boy. Do you greyhound? Oh, he's a whippet. Whippet. And he is just the sweetest thing ever. So, <laughs> so I'm just going to pet him for a minute while we talk. So the, the idea is that my mother wrote all my papers for me until I was 15 and she died. And then I failed English in high school. But you see, I had spent so many years, Julia, like making up stories in my head and always wanting to write and creating, creating. And I learned to communicate through my intuitive sense because my mother was the only one in our house who was allowed to have words. <laughs> oh, no. How interesting is that? So in a sense, that wounding became, it, it prepared me for what happened, well, when I was tw in my 20s, I had a near-death experience and after that, and it's, it, that's a, that, that could take the whole hour, but after that experience, I literally uh, had angels come and start telling me these stories. And I, they wouldn't go away till I wrote them down. <laughs> so oh. you can imagine. <laughs> but I was uniquely wounded. I was uniquely gifted with these wounds from my mother to take dictation. So I literally wrote these fables down word for word, and they later become, became the Chakra Wisdom Oracle, which is what all of the work I do is based on now. But if I hadn't been wounded in that way, if I hadn't had that personal wounding and recognized it, I wouldn't have had the skill set to do this particular kind of work. So that's a it, good point. And that's kind of what, that's really what I believe. And when I created this one course, this life purpose divination, it's actually kind of funny because it's the old story. You know, I try, I was trying to create a, how to read my chakra wisdom oracle card course. You know, I tried to, I was trying to create a course on how to read my cards. And it's almost like the, the joke of the guy who created, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the, uh, not, oh, post-it notes. Uh huh. And he was trying, trying to, he's right? trying to do something else. Right. He was trying to do permanent bond and they would, they came off and he thought it was a huge failure. So, you know, but it's, we love him. <laughs> well, we do do that post <laughs> so that's the thing is that we've come to, and, and for those of us that are old school, we use post-it notes a lot. a lot. I do. I do too, because it really is, it, it, it kind of creates that visual and now they've got writing programs that kind of use them as well. So it's an interesting thing that I was trying to do a course on how to read the cards. And instead I, I did a course on how to tap into trust and live with your intuition and people who do it walk away with like, like mind blowing insights to it. But the idea of the three roadblocks are that the first one of course is that you you know, you recognize that you use buzzwords. And the second one is the autopilot. And the third is recognizing that we get stopped at the same point every time. So one of the things that happens, and I'm sure you'll, you'll understand this, is that the, it's the same emotion that stops us in everything that, get, that blocks us. And so what this is about, what this entire conversation is about, is that when that happens, to step back into a neutral observer and look at it slightly differently so that you can create a breakthrough in your life. And that's the basic thrust of three roadblocks. And of course, all of that information and all of that work came about from the Chakra Wisdom Oracle cards, which I had self-published. Do you know the story of that at all? Did you? No, I'd love to hear the story of that. Oh, it's okay. It's, it's one, and I don't tell it very often. So it's kind of my crazy little story. But so when I was in my twenties, I had a near death experience. And then after that experience, as I mentioned, I had angels or spirits, if you will, coming and telling me what I thought were ridiculous stories. And, and they wouldn't go away till I wrote these down. So what ended up happening was my, as I wrote these down, they, 
they were coming to me in color because I had written a book on color. I had for uh, Putnam, I had a book out on fashion and color, right? Uh So all of the colors came through and I couldn't figure out what that was about. And so I had over, uh, over 45 fables. It was 49 of them. And what happened was I put them into just this binder, so to speak, like in a, you know, folder, threw it in a drawer because I didn't know what to do with them. And one day I, I was doing a mastermind group. I had moved to Los Angeles and, you know, everybody's in the biz, you know, yeah. so we had a mastermind group and we're all sitting around and I, I said, oh, well, let's use these fable things. And I decided to read one one night and it was so moving to everybody and the fable itself had so much power. It, it was really like, wow. And so in that moment, I said, well, why don't I create a, like a, a game around that fable? So then I created a meditation around it and, an, and a group exercise. And thus it began. And over the next year, we met and worked with the fables and created this entire, I want to say like workbook around it. And it was really interesting because the original fables were really what we studied. And something, you know, one of the people in the group said, you know, you're always putting these on paper, the name of the fable and throwing it in a hat. Let's, let's do cards. And I said, okay. So I took my life savings and I was at the time was a hundred thousand dollars, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me it was, and I took every penny of it and I made 10,000 copies of this deck in China (laughs) And I, you know, created this packaging and all the money I had went into it. Well, the day it arrived, Julia, no one told me how many 10,000 was. (laughs) You didn't have any place to put them. (laughs) Put them. I found out later that's the size of a small, like, bookstore, okay? Like, you know, a Barnes & Noble that you see in the mall. That's 10,000, okay? Oh, my God. So I was just like, oh my gosh. And somebody said, what'd you do? I said, well, after I dropped to my knees and cried while I was down there, I prayed, right? And I just said, oh God, show me what to do. And it just, you know, one thing led to another. I managed to get somebody to put it into a storage locker, which I did. And then I didn't know what to do because I was all excited. I run on to put it on Amazon and it turned out that I was going to lose a dollar on every sale. Oh no. I know. And I said, oh, oh my gosh, I can't even sell these. I've got 10,000. I'm broke. I had $5,000 left. And I said, well, what should I do? And I just got really quiet with myself. And I just heard give it away. And I thought, what does that mean? So I put a website up. And I created a shuffler to try the cards. And I did a beautiful shuffler. And people came. One by one, people came and they started using the cards online. There were people using the cards online to the day I stopped doing, you know, I still have it, but it's different now since it was, anyway, let me get to that part of the story. (laughs) So, So what happened was I, one by one, people started saying, can I buy these? And I started selling them off my website. And in about two and a half years, I sold 10,000, just under 10,000 units off my website. And then I was just burnt out and I said, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And something said, go to the UK. And I have some friends, um, Monty and Amy Farber, and they are fabulous. And I called them and said, what should I do? They said, well, we know a couple people. And I said, all right. And I went over to the UK and the, the, one of the people I met there said, you know, they don't do deals in, at the UK book fair, you know, London book fair. It, it's all foreign rights. And I said, it's great. I'm foreign. It'll work out. So it did. I met, um, I met six publishers and had two offers and I went with Watkins books, which I am so thrilled. I did. They're amazing. And the, the, the publisher, Joe had launched Hay House in the UK. She and then she came over to uh, to Watkins, and she was amazing. And she said, "Tori, because at the time I was calling it Color Wisdom," and she said, "We have to change the name because of the UK and US spellings. What do you think of Chakra?" And I thought that's perfect because that's how I teach it, you know. Mm-hmm. So we changed the name and we took the fable 
and we made the we took the full fable and we created a legend which was just a paragraph of it right uh -huh. well what happened was the the book and deck the little deck came out and it was bestseller from the day it came out we've sold 50,000 copies so far wow uh, it's in seven languages and the thing is, my publisher then called one of my practitioners and said, you know, Becky, how'd you learn to read the cards, though? And Becky said, oh, it's really easy. All you have to do is study the fables. And they went, uh-oh, because we had cut the fables out to fit in the packaging. <laughs> so, oh, so nobody was getting the fables. But they still got the deck, which was really amazing. People understood the Shocker Wisdom cards. So what, oh, and get over here. You should hear these dogs. The, come here, puppy. Come here, Gab. <laughs> They're going to go at it in just a moment. So what happened was, it's just like puppies, you know. Come here, Gab. Come over here and talk to Julian. Come here. So what happened in that, in that story was that we um, immediately, Watkins came back and said, oh, my gosh, we have to do the workbook. So that was all the stuff that I was sharing at the beginning with the group dynamic. Yeah, and, so then... Perfect. Right. So that became the Chakra Wisdom Toolkit. What's interesting about that, that sold out before it even was published. And what's interesting now is it's starting to sell more as more and more people recognize what it is. And I just finished the final book in the trilogy, which was how to read the cards for yourself and for others. Because I believe as a psychic that my job is to make my job obsolete. That it's really about you have this gift, you have this information in you. And it's a, it's a map called chakra. And all I have to do is kind of show you where it is, give you some intuitive tips and you'll be able to do it yourself. So that's the idea with that, that piece of work. Here it comes, here comes. Can you show us a picture of the car or show us the cards? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Like I'm, I'm playing with the dog at the same time. Okay. So this is the back of the card. Okay, so this is what it looks like, the deck. Uh-huh. The card. Okay. Now, you know, I'm glad you're asking this because one of the things I didn't say, everybody, was, and, and Julia, is that my, the woman who drew the cards, I found her on the internet. And this is like, I want to say, you know, before it was really big, you know, and I said, can you draw these pictures for me? And she said, sure. And she said, but it's going to take me a year because each one, I have to read each fable, study it, and then, you know, and I said, yeah, I'll really I'm generate the image, yeah. Exactly. So it, it, I said, I've been with this for 15 years. What's another year, right? Right. So, so she drew each card. She got to the 49th card, and she it was the only time we actually talked. She called me, and she said, you know, I feel like there's a 50th, you know, card. And I said, you know what? I don't feel it, but I feel... I feel like there's a 50th angel. I feel like there's another spirit, but I don't feel the card. And I don't know what that's about. Well, when I, when I got the cards made, it was in, I think it was like in um, August of that year. I don't remember what year it is now. It's all blended, but um, it was like August. And it was six months and one day later that, that the, um, the cards had come out. I put them up online and they were starting to sell. And Gretchen, who drew the cards, died. Oh and my goodness! She was she was only forty years old. And what I recognized from this, Julia, is that she was the she was the final angel. Oh, this, this was her legacy for us. Wow! It was such a powerful experience for me because it was it made me recognize all the more importance of it because. It was that, you know, that thing we've heard a lot. And I'm sure, you know, in spiritual circles, people say, don't die with your music in you. And, and I think that's what makes the Chakra Wisdom Oracle card so powerful is that when people dig it, they're like, wow, this is great. And then I'll have some people, just a small smattering of people go, this is the worst ever. And it's, there's no one in between who go, they're okay. It, it's really fascinating because you're either – you're either somebody who really wants to step into your purpose and your life and you get this or you don't. And it really is interesting to see how it has just, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a, she does a lot, she does a lot of deck work. Uh, her, um, 
Colette Baron reed and, and we were talking about it, and she said, Tori, do you recognize that this deck has stayed in the top 10 for two years? And I said, no, I, I hadn't thought about that, you know, like, but it, it, it hit me that it wasn't that I did such great work. It's that I didn't give up on what was meant to come forward. Mm. And, and I think that really when, when we find our purpose, it is like something stuck in our craw. You know, we just can't stop. It's like, you just, you just have to keep going. And I think that what these cards and what, when I call it chakra wisdom oracle, what the, what the oracle taught me was so much more than just reading a card because it was more about how are we living our lives and, and who are we in this conversation, you know, and, and the miracles that can begin to happen when we really choose the accelerated spiritual path for ourselves, you know, yeah, it's such a fabulous journey. It really is. And I mean, you know, because you've spent your, so much of your work, Julia, is like guiding people through, right. this, through these interviews, you know, and that's pretty magical. Yeah, it's fun too. And I learned such amazing things. That's what I mean. You're just this walking kind of knowledge stream. <laughs> and I think that's, I think that's kind of, you know, where do we bring, what is our, what is it we need to be doing for ourselves? And I think, you know, I think that psychics get a bad rap. Um, but I think it's also because a lot of psychics use their brain because they want to look good. And I think they, they try to give advice rather than allow the energy just to move through them to support the other person in what they know, you know, right. um, that's a tough one though. Cause the brain is so insistent. It is, which is why when I teach people to use the cards and even with the, the course I'm talking about life purpose divination, it really is one of those things where, you know, when I teach it, it's like, it just keeps saying intuition, intuition, intuition. And it just really kind of startles you by saying, wow, I knew that already. You know, what, how did I know that? And a lot of the exercises are, it, it, I, I, I create them so that it talks to your intuition and not your brain. So your brain will be like, I want to quit. This is so confusing. Mm -hmm. And I keep telling people throughout the course, because it's this one I'm talking about. It's like, is a downloadable course. So you'll constantly hear me saying, I know you want to quit, but if you're confused, you're doing it right. If you want to quit, you've done something wrong. <laughs> so it's, it's almost antithetical, right, to the way we think. Because it really is, and I constantly say to people, if you understand this, then you're doing it wrong. And if you seek to understand it, you're doing it incorrectly. If you're doing it and you have no idea what you're doing and you're completely lost, you're doing it right. Wow. That's Which, right. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so it is an interesting thing of, well, which way do we go? What's the, you know, um, and do you have any tips on how to stop the brain from being so insistent and getting in the way? Well, I think that's a really good point. I think the thing is, is that we don't ever want to stop the brain. Because you see, the brain actually does serve us. What we want to do is recognize how the brain works. And, how, and I'll give you a story of that, of that exact example. You're just reminding me of something that was fabulous. When I really discovered that we don't ever want to stop the brain, we want to recognize that the brain and the intuition can work together and that we set the brain up to protect us. So I'm going to give you an example and I talk about this actually in my new book where I had a client come to me and she wanted to work in an ad agency. Well, she always wanted to be an art director. That was her dream. And she was very qualified to do so. Okay. Yet she could never get a job in an office ever. She always worked for independent. People. <laughs> oh, and get over here. Come here. Come here. Come on. Sorry. They, they always do this, like, and it's like, okay, Owen, enough. Come here. Come, come. Come. Now. Sorry. Sorry, guys. I think we can pause this. I'm, yeah, we can pause. 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 Okay. Go ahead. 
Okay. So basically what we're talking about is that this client of mine was so qualified to work in an ad agency. And what happened was she could never get a job in an office. So everything around her was like, she could get freelance gigs, she, but her career never went past this. So she came to me, she'd been in therapy and I want to really validate therapy. I think it's a great process. I think there are so many people that benefit from it. Okay. And I think it's great. So that said, she came to me, she was sent by her therapist. <laughs> of course, I get a lot of referrals from therapists because they want me to help them with the breakthrough so they can then help on the other side. So nobody could figure out what this was. And I said, well, let's take a look at this. And I said, what's going on with the office thing? And she said, I don't have any issues around this. And I said, okay, so what we did in order to, and again, we're talking right now about the brain and the intuition, right? Mm -hmm. Now the brain, remember, the brain is always trying to protect us. So if there's something that's a block, it is because the brain decided it was dangerous to be in an office. So I said, well, did anything dangerous ever happen in an office? I'm surprised no one asked her this. She said, no, nothing. I've always been, you know, fine. And I said, okay, let's look at the seven steps to completing. So, and, and again, this is, a, this is a reading that I use. And so the, the, you begin with the end in mind. I said, well, so we want to, we, you want to get a job as a, in, in art directing. And so the first step was I get my resume together. I send it out. Second step, I create a website. Third step, maybe slightly slept, but, but you know, third step. Fourth step, I wait. I said, wait. I said, okay, then what? She said, well, nothing. I, the fifth and sixth step, nothing ever happens, so I never get there. And I said, it's really interesting that the fourth step, heart chakra, remember I do chakra work, mm -hmm. says, wait, why is her heart telling her to wait? And she said, this is the strangest thing, but I just remember screaming when I was little, like not little, but I was a teenager, maybe 14 or so. And I was screaming at my mom, just wait, just wait. Don't go to work today. Wait. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, my mom was murdered at work. <gasps> oh, my God. And I said, so, so let me get this straight. So you don't want to work in an office. Your brain has completely said no way. Mm -hmm. Because you will be murdered in the workplace. Mm -hmm. and, and this, when we have a shock like that to our system, like our brain steps in and takes over. Our brain says, nope. So she was never going to get a job in an office. It didn't matter if she married the owner. Do you know what I mean? She, nothing would have gotten her in that office because her brain said, no, it'll kill you. Wow. She, and I'm getting truth bumps, even as I retell it. Yeah. I call it truth bumps, truth bumps. She said, to, you know, and this is the thing people say to me, how do we shut our brain down? Don't, don't, because your brain is trying to protect you. And, and she even said, well, how do I change this? What do I do to get rid of it? I said, you can't get rid of it, but here's what you can do. You must immediately acknowledge that you've done something very good. You must acknowledge your brain and say, wow, wow. You protected me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And brain, what if I reassign you to another job because you did such a good job here? Mm -hmm. So you can work with reassigning. So for that, I kind of, I sent you to a therapist, but... But one of the things that does happen, and I think a lot of times in this work that I do, which is, you know, the chakra wisdom work, the life purpose work, the roadblock work, all of that is really about understanding that we don't tie things up in a bow, Julia. You know, people want to get to the, I got to get rid of this. I say, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Let's just find <laughs> out what, you, right? Let's right. just find out why you put it there first. You know, True. and I think that we've gotten to this quick fix thing where our brain will not quick fix. Our brain absolutely needs the time to kind of feel safe again and go, oh, 
wow, I did a good job. Because you see, if you yell at somebody, if I start screaming at somebody, you're messing me up and I hate you. It's basically what we're saying to our brain. And what do you think this, that person's going to do? Really? Really? I'm protecting you from getting murdered. <laughs> I'm not doing nothing for you. So you see, we, we shut down even more. Uh-huh. Oh, we my get God, yeah. more upset. And we get even more angry. And we get so angry at ourselves that what do we do? We overeat. We become cutters. We drink too much. We do everything to shut down our brain. And that's what, that's what we're trying to do. So now your thing is, well, we know that. What do we do? And so what I started, to, that's where when I developed the life purpose divination work, I started to recognize that your intuition is always talking. Your brain's job is to shut it down so that your brain can protect you from, in this case, being murdered for this one woman, right? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I'm so upset. I said, it's okay to be in upset. It's okay. You are not upset. You are in upset and it's okay. And you have to be there for just a, a little bit of discomfort to recognize and see all the nuances of what your brain has helped you create. And she got it. And within a couple days, things shifted for her. And I want you to know, she decided probably within a week to move to New York. And now she works at an ad agency in New York. Wow. So, you know, and this was like within a month or two, she got the job. Because you see, her brain suddenly didn't have to protect her in that way. And also, number two, her brain was, was, was validated, right? Because mm -hmm. her brain was like, oh, I did a good job. Yeah. And, and what that did was then her brain, thinking it did a good job, said to the intuition, why don't you take over here? I got this. <laughs> so your brain will start to work in unison like two pistons firing with your intuition. So the idea is that this work that I do shows you how to work with your intuition so that, and I always say there's a so that, so that your brain will then work in unison. It's like windshield wipers. You can have one, but two work better. And the other thing that's very interesting is I, I did a, a class recently and I, one of the women called in and we're, we're doing this uh, class on, on uh, communication. And there's a card in the deck that's specific to that. And I said, uh, we were talking about it and I said, well, tell us the story that you wanna tell us. And she was saying that she had a friend who really criticized her when she said something, I want to do this. And her friend said, good luck with that. And she said, you know, I just don't know how to handle it. Long story short, when I got to the pl place of, un you know, really getting that our brain says that's not good. Right. Mm -hmm. and she said, you know what? I really need to stand up for myself. You're right. And I said, well, what we can say is, ouch, you know, we could say that that doesn't feel good, you know? <laughs> But the thing that we forget in our society, Julia, is that we've gotten, we've forgotten that there's a so that with everything. In other words, yes, I need to take care of myself and stand up for myself so that I can do the same for others. It's, I learn, I put my own mask on first so that I can take care of others. Too much of it is I'm just standing up for myself. And it's kind of like, well, good for you. Go stand in a corner then. You know, you're an interesting yeah. to me, you know. It, it really is about being there for each other. But we need to learn these techniques and these skills. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying I'm the be-all, end-all. I'm just saying this is what I teach. Now, other people teach similar things or different ways. And... For me, I have to say recently, one of the most rewarding, um, I would say the biggest rewarding feedback I got was I teach this technique of neutral observer, which is about neutrally observing. It's not about not being involved emotionally. You feel the feelings and go, wow, that's interesting. I'm really an upset over that. Okay, now I'll do the dishes, right? Mm -hmm. And I was talking about how to use neutral observer to gain some distance, but observe your feelings and say, yeah, I'm feeling in upset. Yeah, that's pretty, feels pretty bad. Yet do nothing about it. Just observe it. And the tendency for a lot of people is to look at something and respond or react to it, right? We don't act, we react. 
Mm -hmm. And this one woman in one of my classes said I had the biggest breakthrough and we were all excited and I was like, yeah, and she posted it. And basically it was, she, her son was trying to say, what are you doing with this new, what is neutral observer? And so she said to him, well, this is how it works. Anytime something happens, whether it's good or bad, you say that's interesting. And you just keep saying that's interesting until some awareness comes forward. And he was trying to, he was really worried about how he looked, how he appeared to others. And so he started working this skill of, that's interesting, every time he was worried about something. And one, one day he said to her, you know, that's interesting. And he stopped and he looked at his mom and he said, you know what? I really am doing all this so that I look good. I want to look good all the time. That's interesting. <laughs> so it caused him to have insight. Right. And that's why we do it ultimately, because we do want to give to other generations. We do want to give back that it, you know, it's not just for us. It's for, it's the skills we never learned. You know, our parents didn't really know how to communicate. You know, they knew how to survive. And we're in such a, we're in such a powerful time of fast communication. I mean, you know, within 30 seconds, what someone thinks about what your president tweeted today. I mean, you know, <laughs> like it's, it, and we, we cannot get away from it. And I think in, in my estimation, it's very important for us to have the skills of our intuition back. Yes. That's something that we've given up in favor of our brain of looking good, making sure we we're socially, you know, um, acceptable, you mm -hmm. know, so I think there's a lot of this type of thing that is very valuable. Ultimately, I've got to be honest with you. I didn't know any of it until I started studying the Chakra Wisdom Oracle. I mean, really, the, the fables taught me a lot. And I, I'm always learning. I mean, I don't have the be-all, end-all knowledge of it. I'm always in evolution with it. And I'm always, I'm always fascinated with the way other people pick stuff up. Like there's a card in here called Reggie Rust. And it is the, um, it's the card of the impasse. So it's what stops us, mm -hmm. you know, but it's not what stops you. It just says not this way, not right now. It's not a no, it's go around it. And I remember people were really in upset over that card. And, and one of the girls in the, in the class I was teaching this a few years ago, she said, well, you know, Reggie's like a guardian angel. So he kind of protects us from making those choices. And I went, oh, that's brilliant. So <laughs> I love that. I love that kind of interaction that we get with others. So. Tori, we're running out of time. So I would like you to tell <laughs> us where, if people want to get a hold of you, how can they do that? Well, you can go to my website, toriheartman.com. It's the best way to get a hold of me. I think we sent you some information too. So okay. people can get the download from you. I know that we have the, uh, the ebook, Three Roadblocks You Must Face on the Way to Your Destiny. Oh, yes. That's, your, that's the gift that, that, uh, that everybody can get from you. Okay. And you will find me through that as well. I really recommend people read that because it's just a great, it's, a, it's free. It's just a, it's a great read. I always reread it when I do these kind of, <laughs> you know, when I'm talking to other people. Uh -huh. There's a lot of good okay. skills in there. So they can go on to my website and get that. It'll be in the news section of how to get that book. And they can go to ToriHartman.com. Oh, and Tori, you're going to join our group, aren't you? And they can connect with you there, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you just send me a link, I'll do that. I'll get that from you after so I can join. Okay. Absolutely. I love right. doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you.